questões centrais se confrontam as cidades. Qual o lugar da cultura no percurso para sociedades mais coesas e sustentáveis? Impulso, Fórum Político da Arte em Rede. Debates, entrevistas e conversas com profissionais da cultura, investigadores, autarcas e agentes de desenvolvimento local. De 7 a 11 de junho, nos canais digitais Arte em Rede. First of all, we want to thank Art and Red for this opportunity and for this invitation that honors, honors us a lot, myself and Hugo Cruz. And then also to thank you, Francois, for accepting us as your interviewers today. Uh, I will start by introducing Ugu, so that we all know who he is very shortly. Ugu Cruz is a cultural programmer a teacher, a community artist, actively engaged on laying the ground for the development of participatory art in Portugal. Using theater as the main language for his work with very harsh social environments in Portugal and abroad, he has not only created a personal artistic practice, but is also involved in the research of the artistic collective process from the theoretical viewpoint. Thank you, Madalena. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a pleasure to be talking with uh, two reference from community, community and participatory arts and two people that uh, personal um, like a lot too. Uh, so it's very, very, very special moment. Thanks, uh, Art in Red, for this. I start uh, by presenting Madalena and then uh, Francois Matarazzo. Uh, Madalena Vitorino, um, it, it's, it, it's not uh, possible to talk about participatory and uh, community arts in Portugal, namely, namely uh, in dance, and not talking about uh, Madalena Vitorino. Uh, the, um, Madalena is the choreographer, masters, dance and theater, as well as the artistic, educational and community dimensions. Her work uh, has brought the possibility of reinventing the relationships between protagonists, audience and space with the body as the um, guiding aware. Madalena is also a cultural progr progr programmer and curator having held different functions over the years, such as in field of dance pedagogy. Nowadays, she, <coughs> she building the project Lavrar o Mar in the most forgotten places in, a, in the Alentejo, south of Portugal. And now, Francoise Matarazzo is a com community artist, writer and researcher, Uh, with uh, 40 years experience in and beyond Europe. Among many and various publications, it stands out the book uh, Restless Hearts, edited in Portugal by Fundação Carlos de Gulbenkian. Recently, uh, he was the lead author of the text for the Rome Charter in the last year, a process to focus on the, on the cultural rights of citizens. And yes. it's, it's all <laughs> in this moment. Having made um, our presentations, and now we, we go forward to the questions that Ugu and myself have prepared for you. And the first one is about the deep roots of participatory art and community art. Um, we would like to know where and when did they begin? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, honor of inviting me to, to speak to you today. I'm very glad to be here and I, um, I'm grateful to you both for making the, the effort to speak in a second or third language. So I'll try to be as clear as I can. Um, the roots of participatory and community art, there are two answers to that question. 
the immediate roots, I think, belong to the 1960s and the challenge to cultural authority in many respects that emerged then and young artists asking questions about who was entitled to make art and who is also entitled to judge it. But actually, I think the, the longer roots back in my mind, the, the 19th century and the emergence of industrial society in Europe, which is simultaneously the emergence of the concept of fine art. Because I, uh, as soon as you invent an idea like fine art, then you automatically invent not fine art, which is all of the arts that everyone who is not an aristocrat is involved in. So this two-tier system is a part of European culture now for more than two centuries. And that has created a dynamic and a, and a contestation about what is artistically valuable and meaningful and what isn't. So the, uh, the roots are complicated, I think. <laughs> um, Francoise, what are, uh, what are the contributions of participatory and community arts to the present and future of the communities, in your opinion? The, on the one hand, uh, they are the same as they have always been, which is, for me, I think art is a sense-making system, a, a meaning-making system. It's how human beings, it's how we understand and think about our experience, this strange experience of being alive in the world, and how we try to find sense in that, and crucially, how we then try to share that sense with other people. That's why we create art, because we want other people to understand what it feels like to be us, and we want to understand what it feels like to be them, and, and what is meaningful, what is important to us about that. We never make art about things that are unimportant. We make art about the things that matter to us. Uh, so that's always been, I think, what art is about. And it, it has always been a, a space in which human beings grow and develop. That was evident from the earliest roots of art in, in Europe in the classical period, the idea that art was a means of personal development how we cultivate ourselves so the idea of a cultivated person so it's a it's always been a powerful means for us to grow as human beings and to fulfill our potential at the same time and this is the basis of of my work in in community art um, it is it's always been evident to me that many of our, our fellow citizens don't have equal access to, to those means of development and education and growth and connection and meaning making. And consequently, the kind of work that, that I have been involved in, and I know that you have both been involved in, has a significant social dimension in trying to ensure that everybody has the means to do this. But I frame it in that way because there is some expectation that somehow uh, participatory projects can do good to people. They don't do any more good to people than any other uh, cultural artistic projects do. They All artistic projects can empower us if because they give us the means for growth and, and development. And so that, I think, remains as much true for poor people as it does for rich people. And that, for me, is the basis of why this matters. You say that it is uh, in the south of Europe that perhaps the most challenging participatory art projects are happening. Why is that? I think there are uh, the reasons are not necessarily good ones. Um, it is 
partly because it has developed more recently in countries like Portugal and Spain um, than in, in countries in Northern Europe. Partly it's also because it is less well-funded. I think that in a country where I've done a lot of my work, the UK, um, the, the amount of funding that now comes toward to community and participatory art is very substantial from the state in particular. And with that funding comes expectations and obligations that are not necessarily those that communities or artists have. They are those that the state has. And I think that sometimes in, in some of the Northern European countries, there is a there is a, an unhealthy relationship between the, the state actors and the cultural actors, a, a, a relationship of mutual dependence and a reinforcing of a certain set of ideas and attitudes about the people that they think they are doing this work for. And that I think is problematic. Because it's more recent, development in countries of Southern Europe, and there is less, uh, less control exercised by uh, state actors. That creates a lot of freedom. Um, one of the, in the UK, I started working in community arts in 1980, 1981. It was still a very young field at that point and it didn't have there wasn't a, a precedent what i mean is the artists were inventing how to do it um, and finding solutions nowadays i think in the uk there is a, because there are uh, 50 or 60 years of of practice many artists think that there's a certain way in which you should do things and I'm not sure that's true, Ev not sure that's ever true. I think that art needs to keep reinventing ways of doing things, not its values, but the methods. And I think from the work that I've seen in Portugal and in other Southern European countries, I'm very excited by the open space that artists have to uh, imagine working in, in new ways. And that won't exist forever. Even if the state actors don't uh, come into the territory, still that idea of that there's a correct way to do this will gradually uh, start to be established as it happens in all art forms. There's a moment of, of discovery, of innovation, then a moment of, of where things are in a good balance and then we get old and a bit arthritic and we start not moving so fast or so easily. It's, it's the teenager moment uh, of the community arts in Portugal. <laughs> yeah. So what, what the principal adaptations have been the, developed in the participatory and co community arts during the pandemic time and which may indicate others' possible futures? The pandemic has been very hard. All community art, participatory art, as the word says, it's about bringing people together. And when you can't bring people together safely, then it, it touches at the heart of this work. So I've, I think there have been two broad reactions. The biggest has been to go online and a lot of people have led workshops, even dance workshops and theatre workshops online. And they have been surprisingly successful. I, I did some creative writing workshops earlier this year. It's the first time I've ever tried to do that work online. And I was surprised at it's different but I was surprised at how it, it creates a new dynamic. 
there, there can be an intimacy in, a, in talking to people online. One of the things that I think happens is we look each other in the eye online much more easily because in a room, it's hard to like, now I'm looking at you both in the eye and I'm not embarrassed, I'm not having to break away. And so there's a, there's a much more direct relationship there which can create an intimacy. And there's also, I'm finding, and I was having conversations with, with people about this just yesterday. Um, there's a, I'm working on a project about community opera, one of which is, is um, with, uh, happening in, in Portugal. And we had a, we, but yesterday we had a meeting with some young women who were working on a community opera with people with Parkinson's. And they thought this couldn't work offline, but actually they've discovered that the people with Parkinson's are finding it easier to engage online, partly because they have problems with speaking and the microphone helps, but also they're discovering that some people who are, were more shy in the room are suddenly feeling more confident because they're at home and they're the, the, the context is different. Of course, there are big problems with working online. Uh, lots of people don't have access to the equipment or the bandwidth is poor and, and so on. Um, so we have to, to bear that in mind. And that's the other big uh, effort that people have made. They've, some of the most imaginative work has been to find ways of staying connected with people safely. So, so creating socially distanced performances and workshops, uh, working with people um, inside houses and outside houses and so on, uh, sending things to people that are on paper, uh, things for them to, to do and activities that don't require computers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that's really important and we're still learning how to do that we're we're um it's a bit as if we're being uh, simultaneously flung into the future and into the past in terms of our work we we're going in the future with the digital technology and discovering new ways of working but we're also going in into the past to a time when we didn't need electricity uh to make things happen <laughs> So, um, who do we need to call? Who are the protagonists, in your view, that are needed to make participatory art a strong reality and part of the cultural life of territories, being either urban or rural, these territories? The only, the only thing that I have discovered essential that I have discovered over the years is the people who live in a place. You don't need artists, you don't need community artists, you don't need funders, you don't need the state. You only need, the only thing you cannot do this work without is people who want to make art together. Uh, it doesn't matter their reason for doing it, their why they they, they have done it. So I think that the work will always happen because it is it's a natural part of human um, the human spirit, as I said at the beginning. People want, we need to tell stories. We need to sing songs. We need to find ways of creating meaning. And so that will always happen. I think that one of, the, one of the mistakes that artists sometimes make is to think that they are bringing something to communities. They're not. The communities already have what they need. Um, what they can bring is an ear to listen. And I think that's the most important thing that artists need to do, is not to... to to go in like saviors, uh, thinking that they have the answer, but to go in and be willing to listen, to, to be willing to listen to somebody is a great gift. It's a gift of respect. 
it's a gift of uh, honoring what somebody else may have to say to you. And then you can, as an artist, you can bring your own gifts and knowledge and, and so on and find connections into what you're hearing from people. But uh, the best work, I think, always comes from the communities themselves and from the ability of artists to listen to. It's some, the communities may not know what they're looking for or what they're hungry for. And that's one of the gifts that the artist may, may have as an outsider to be able to say, to be able to recognize what might work what might be the thing that could happen then? But it starts with listening for me. Mm -hmm. um, in your point of view, what is the role of uh, public institutions in promoting participatory and community arts as part of the cultural policies of the places? I think it's, it, it's very important. as. You, you um, referred to, to the, the 2020 Rome Charter that I worked on last year. Um, it, that project started with the idea of people in Rome, including the vice mayor, asking themselves, in effect, what is our responsibility to the people of the city? in cultural terms. And the starting point then is Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's the obvious starting point because it says that everyone has the right to participate in the cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts. But what does that mean to participate in the cultural life of the community? I think that if you asked any government in the world they would say, yes, we think that's a good idea and all our citizens can do it. But how the Chinese government thinks uh, that works compared to the Brazilian government or the American government, it's very different. So in that process, we came up with five capabilities, five things that people, everyone should be able to do and they were very simple because the first idea is that if citizens don't understand cultural policy, then it serves no purpose. How can they engage with cultural policy if they don't understand what it means? So the five capabilities are simply these. They are that everybody should be able to discover culture, to enjoy culture, to create culture, to share culture, and to protect culture. And then in the Rome Charter, we explain in more detail what those five things mean in practice. But I think what we were trying to do is to say to anyone, a citizen of, a, of any town or village, say these are in relation to culture, this is what you should be able to do. And I think even if people, some people may not say, they may say, well, that doesn't matter to me. But I think if you ask them about their children or the children of the village, do you think they should be able to do these things? I think almost everyone will say, yes, these things are important for children to be able. And if they see the value for children, then you could say, well, why are they important for children, but not for you? <laughs> and I think that if, if you can do these five things, then you can say, yes, I have the right to participate in the cultural life of, of my community. And I, I hope that the, now the Rome Charter is being adopted by um, local government in different parts of the world. And I also think it could be being adopted by cultural institutions. So a big theater or an orchestra could say, that's our mission. We should enable people to do all five of those things. Not necessarily all at once and, and at different times in your life, you may need to, you may be more interested in one of those things than another. But they are, I think, what 
uh, they are the capabilities that frame your ability to participate in cultural life. And that for me is what uh, cultural policy and local government should be trying to ensure that we as citizens are all able to have. What what do you think? Do we uh, think maybe maybe another another one or two, Francois. It's possible for your time. Sure. Yes, maybe Madalena. I suggest the the last one of face the okay, the disconnection. Yes, mm -hmm. in in the end maybe, but another one. Your question, participatory, it's a uh, potential uh, territory. I think it's good, no? Yeah, maybe, yes. Uh, participatory art is a potential territory that can be working alongside conventional artistic production. What needs to be done to put these two realms of artistic creation side by side and on the same terms of recognition? So another good question. Participatory art, because of what I said earlier about the, the invention of fine art creating this idea that there are less fine arts, we are left with a, with a hierarchical cultural world. Um, not everybody agrees what the shape of the hierarchy is, but for a long time, people did not question that there was a hierarchy. I think that is starting to go and it's starting to flatten. But the last place where people accept there isn't a hierarchy is in those who work in the cultural institutions that represent and benefit from the hierarchy. And I understand why uh, they find it difficult to let go of that idea. But I think they need to, un to accept that to value other forms of art and culture does not mean to value theirs less. It's about recognizing that all forms of art and culture can be good, bad, or indifferent. Mm. Most of them are in the middle, you know, because most of what human beings do is in the middle by definition. It's very rare to be <laughs> world-class, although the art world likes to think that everything it does is extraordinary. Um, but in truth, most of, most of what we do is good enough. And I, I like the idea that things are good enough. Um, but it's important that things are, are judged in their own terms and in their own meaning. And that people, when people are making participatory in community art, they are able to define for themselves the values against which they want that their work to be assessed and responded to. And that they're not being arbitrarily judged by values that don't represent that aren't meaningful to the people who make that, that work. So I think there is still a, I don't have an easy answer to, to your question because in the end, it is, it, it is about status and uh, it's not easy for people to renegotiate their, their status, but I think it needs to happen. Okay, and uh, the last one, the, the disconnection with us and with others that translates uh, into, into a risk of uh, alienation can be most powerful with the pandemic moment. How do you think participatory and community arts can contribute to building connection? I think the pandemic moved us into a world that is unfamiliar, frightening, where many people have suffered, many people are grieving, grieving 
both for people they've lost, but also for ideas and futures and security that they've lost. And one of the things that we all need is to find ways of making sense both of what we've been through, what we're still going through, and of the world that is that will emerge as a result. And that takes me back to my idea that art is about making sense, making meaning. We need to, to create space where people can express themselves, express some of their pain, some of their fears, some of their doubts, some of their anxiety, but also some of their hopes, some of their solidarity. So I don't think that it's art's job or participatory art's job to come up with solutions. It's art's job to come up with a space in which as societies, we can start looking for solutions, or at least for responses, for ways forward. Um, and if we do that, then we will um, we will earn the appreciation of our fellow citizens. If if we create spaces for where they can talk, listen, move, sing, dance, and discover for themselves what kind of shape their lives will take and will be meaningful for them meaningful for them in future thank you <laughs> it's a very special moment this <laughs> this one thank you very much yes thank you very much francois <laughs> you're very kind it's it's um you know it's a uh, a great privilege to be invited to give your opinions like this. So I'm slightly embarrassed, but thank you for, for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.